Well, good evening. I'm Melinda tankard reese and I'm the Movement Director for Collective Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. And it's my privilege to welcome you here to this live Q&A with our special guest who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Thanks so much for caring enough to be here tonight. I know that many of you will be reeling from the content that you've seen. Uh, it is confronting, but thanks for caring enough to be willing to be confronted, to, to face uh, the reality of this uh, growing epidemic of child sexual exploitation and for wanting to do something about it. I'm Melinda Tanker. So I'm going to uh, introduce our guests now. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Arkham Dev, who is a writer and director of The Children in the Pictures. He has over 20 years of experience in broadcast television and digital content. His credits including writing and directing on the 3G of Us for SBS, Storm Surfer for Firelight Productions and The Final Sacrifice for Discovery and National Geographic. Internationally, he's uh, been involved in a wide range of projects from following nomadic tribes in India to chasing the biggest waves in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, searching for Bollywood's next star. Uh, now, I'm just seeing if we have Simon with us. We might still be waiting for uh, Simon. So I will go ahead and introduce uh, Scott. Now, Scott Anderson uh, joined the Queensland uh, Police Force uh, the Police Search Service Child Victim Identification Unit in 2017 as a digital media forensic analyst specialising in audio, video and still image technology, where his professional and academic knowledge aids in the identification and rescue of child sexual exploitation victims. Uh, prior to coming to Australia, he worked in roles providing his expertise to assist government agencies to both counter terrorism and child exploitation activities. I can see we have Simon with us now. Uh, Simon is uh, director and producer of the children in the pictures and he's one of Australia's most experienced documentary filmmakers. He's a former political journalist for The Age and the ABC and has won multiple uh, awards and also was the first filmmaker to be nominated for the coveted Prime Minister's History Prize. And I also have my colleague, Lynn Swanson Kennedy, as she's here with us tonight. She's a Collective Shout campaigner and her specialty is in a corporate social responsibility. And she's also been involved in uh, tracking and reporting thousands of predators active on the social media pages of underage girls. So that's our lineup uh, tonight. I'll be uh, moderating the panel and please feel free to drop your questions to the panel in the chat. And we'll do our best to get to as many as we can in the time that we have together tonight. Now, while your questions are coming in, I'm going to kick things off uh, by asking Dev. Uh, Dev, I understand that the idea for this film was yours. Uh, can you tell us how you got that idea and why you believe that the children in the pictures had to be made? Thank you, Dev. Dev, I think you are muted. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was just about to say, um, thanks for everyone for attending the screening. Um, look, I'll give the shortened version, but at the time, um, I was uh, doing research on another documentary project about um, high-risk uh, re-offenders, prisoners um, who, who are in and out of the prison system. But at the time, there was also a lot of uh, chit-chat about um, what was going on uh, on the dark web, uh, stories about the Silk Road and, um, you know, various kind of, uh, you know, explorations into the dark web were happening. Uh, I interviewed a child sex offender who said, look, on the dark web, there are these communities of tens of thousands of uh, members uh, exchanging huge amounts of material. Um, and basically, you know, he described them as a society. And that kind of just piqued my interest. I, I kind of didn't believe him at the time, but um, look, I did a bit of research 
I landed on a site where there was indeed 45,000 members, um, a hierarchical community exchanging material of uh, extreme, extremely uh, basically hardcore material of um, child sexual abuse. Mm. I just couldn't believe the scale, the, the, just the sheer scale of it. Um, that, that, that was the first thing that hit me. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I couldn't um, wrap my head around was, um, you know, who was doing anything about it? Mm. And through the research, the, 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 the name Task Force Argos kept on coming up. Mm-hmm. I reached out to Task Force Argos and told them about the site that I'd visited and um, the head of the unit, John, patiently listened to me and, um, you know, said that they were pretty busy at the time, but he would get back to me. Uh, little did I know that they were had actually taken over and were running that site. Wow. So in a three-month period, they'd closed that site. Then basically John said, um, yeah, look, uh, we, can, we can talk. Um, he invited me to a conference where he basically introduced me to all his colleagues from around the world. And, yeah, that's kind of where, you know, our, our voyage as filmmakers started, you know, basically just researching and interviewing the world's, you know, the world's, I guess, best uh, people in um, child protection. Mm-hmm. Dev, have you been encouraged by the response so far? And what would you like to see happen as a result of the education and awareness raising that this film provides? Well, look, I mean, hopefully I, I, I want the audience to sort of realise that, um, you know, th- this, was, this was just a view from the coalface. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the law enforcement perspective. But the scale of this problem makes it more than a law enforcement problem. Yeah. Um, there's lines in the film like, you know, we the law enforcement are not going to arrest our way out of this. Yeah. So then the question gets opened up to what do uh, we do as a society, as, a, as human beings, a global united world, uh, to um, protect our children, you know, I, Hopefully it gets to the stage where we can stop looking at statistics, yeah. uh, huge volumes of statistics where we refer to children, some of our most vulnerable members of our communities as victims, mm-hmm. and look at them more as um, you know, assets that we're protecting. You know, mm-hmm. I hope that that's where the impact campaign leads us to. Excellent. Thank you so much. Simon, tell us how you came to be involved and was there a particular moment during the filming that was especially tough especially hard uh for you um dev came to see me i'm i'm you know as you mentioned melinda i've, I've been at it a long time um i've um told a lot of stories um yeah. and and i suppose also that i was moving in a, in a field where I suppose it began probably 15 years ago with films like Inconvenient Truth, where the film became more than just the film. And and I could see pretty quickly that if we were going to do this as a documentary, that that's fine. And it has to stand on its feet as as, you know, an important and powerful story. But equally, we needed to do more with the film if we were going to get that kind of eyeball attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was an opportunity to really address what is I think in in many ways, and I'm sure Scott will have opinions about this. And and but this is really a crime that thrives in silence. This is um, probably the world's fastest growing serious crime. It it's it's deeply underreported. It's I mean, for instance, when Dev told me, and we began, I began to realize the scale and sophistication of these networks mm-hmm. and also the way the technology was beginning to expand so that now this it was an issue for every child with a with a phone in their pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it became apparent to me that this was a really, really very big story, but it was ab- absolutely not being discussed as such. Uh, and, you know, I would argue that it's on a me too scale. I won't run you through the statistics now, but it, it's vast. I mean, over 20 million reports of um, child exploitation material go to authorities every year. And then it, it coincided with something very important, which we've just seen this week. And that was the, if you like, the, the negative side of technology. Our reliance on, on social media now is, is uh, so extensive, uh, not just in the Western world, but in the developing world. I mean, there are 300 million Indians on Facebook, for instance. Um, and so the, the, 
the coverage now is global. So we're really dealing with a you know extraordinarily widespread problem. I thought there would be half a dozen films out there already yeah. on the subject, honest to tell you the truth. I mean, as a producer, that's my job. To, I mean, is there any point us, can we say anything more that hasn't been said already? And we are the only film, actually, that explores this, the only film in the world that actually explores this bigger issue. Yes, there have been television programs about pedophiles, and, but rather the more suburban variety, not, not these vast networks. And equally, I think also we found, um, I'm pleased to say, I mean, you know, a great deal of willingness on behalf of law enforcement to actually discuss the problem. I, I've made films with police before. It's always difficult. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, usually... People like us are their last priority, of course, for understandable reasons. Um, and but in this case, I think you know the feeling we were getting from from not only John Rouse and his team at Argos, but um, from the federal police and from international law enforcement agencies also, because we've been speaking with them, mm -hmm. um, was that they really wanted to get this message out. And I I was struck by a phrase used by um, the Australian Federal Police's top officer in this, Lisa Gale, who said, you know, in reporting it, he said, don't turn your television down, turn your television up when this comes across. And I, I reached out, I knew it was going to be big. And to answer the second part of your question, um, to an old friend of mine, a very experienced producer, Tony Wright, who we've been working with on the on the film. Tony made, you know, the Dr. Blake mysteries and IMAX films and has been at it a long time, even longer than me. Tony is a survivor of, of um, child sexual abuse um, in an institutional um, environment, in his case. Mm -hmm. uh, and he bravely said, yes, let's, let's take this on. And I think that really um, got us through the tougher times. It took a long time for everything to happen. I mean, just imagine every time we go onto the Argos floor, they have to shut down. You know, you know they can't have us filming yeah. what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis for understandable mm -hmm. reasons. And so every time we're there, we're preventing them actually saving children so it's a it's a you know quite a balancing act and there's you know many reasons why there's things they can talk about and there's things they can't talk about what, what I did find there you know in my 30 plus years of making these sorts of stories I've met some remarkable people but I don't think I've ever met a more remarkable group of people in one place mm -hmm. and that became our kind of touchstone for being able to tell what otherwise is a very obviously a very very confronting story and it is the the goodness, the courage, the determination, mm -hmm. the the willingness to you know put themselves at risk mm -hmm. uh, because dealing with this stuff every day is quite toxic. Um, you know, just just remarkably brave mm -hmm. people who are doing everything they can do on behalf of who, on behalf of the most vulnerable members and the most valuable members of our society, mm -hmm. our children, and not enough other people are really. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you so much for that very thoughtful and reflective response and a, a great segue to you Scott because uh, you are at the coalface you're staring into the abyss every day you're seeing the worst of of humanity every day when I watch the children in the pictures and just in our own work with our team at Collective Shout um, you know I'm really interested in how, how do you survive it how do you process it how do you not have it in your head you know all, all the time turning up for work day after day knowing what you're going to see how, how do you deal with that uh and no, it's a good question uh because anybody who is exposed to this for any period of time it definitely affects you in some in some manner because mm -hmm. you are seeing kind of the worst of the worst of humanity mm -hmm. you're seeing some very vulnerable children being abused and you can just see it in their eyes that this is clearly a small portion of what they're actually going through because you know as as uh, Simon and Dev have said you know the the volume of material that we see is is vast already mm -hmm. right but um, if you really look at the numbers what we see and what's being shared is probably just a small fraction of what's actually been created and what's actually been recorded which is in and of itself a small fraction mm -hmm. of what actual abuse is is happening with with children all over the world so you know it's uh <laughs> It's very hard not to get sucked into this hole of, you know, sadness and and this, you know, this negative abyss. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the one saving grace is, you know, especially in Task Force Argos where where we work, you know, the mandate that we have is if we find a child in need, we have enough information to identify that children, we can 
gather as much information as we can and deliver it to the jurisdiction where that where you know they can save those children mm -hmm. and so you know you get a lot of positive feedback i think from from what we do the the team that i work with is is definitely some of the most talented investigators that i've i've ever worked with mm -hmm. um very prolific very hard working very good at their job and have amassed a good team around them and have amassed a great network um globally yeah. Um, so I think the one thing that kind of gets me through this is the fact that there are more people like us out there um, in law enforcement around the globe who are trying to do just as much as we are. And so as far as that network is concerned, it's a it's a very uh, large and thriving network who is very helpful to each other, reinforces each other, um, will, you know, at a drop of a hat, provide technology or capability to someone, even though it's, it's not a child in their jurisdiction. It's not a child that has anything to do with, with them, but because it is a child on the internet, um, it is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that in and of itself, you have a lot of positive feedback from, mm -hmm. from other members of, of law enforcement. Right. Um, so, yeah, and you get a lot of, uh, you know, and when they do arrest the children and you get pictures of children being rescued and saved, it's a, it's a nice positive feedback that kind of just helps you get over that hump to the next mm -hmm. person. Um, so you try not to get bogged down in the fact that this is just a really massive problem that we that we're trying to to deal with, mm -hmm. and you're only mopping up drops of water as you know a, a, a fire hydrant is broken and just spewing, um, yeah. you know, massive volumes of water out on the street. What are your biggest frustrations in this work? What are the biggest obstacles uh, you face? Uh, for example, back in 2017, I wrote a piece for the ABC about how our ISPs and telcos were actually facilitating and enabling uh, the live streaming of child abuse, child sexual exploitation, live distant child abuse. And the, the police at the time were expressing frustration that uh, they have, you know, so much evidence now to uh, to make an arrest and lay charges, but they they needed the ISP details to finalise the investigations. And in the bulk of cases, uh, the ISPs wouldn't hand over those details. And something I learned in the last 48 hours was that in Australia, you actually have to pay the ISPs to get the information that you want to make an arrest. How frustrating would that be? Well, I, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because one of the biggest challenges that we face right now is this, this idea of jurisdiction, where if you're, if the child or the offender is not in the jurisdiction where you live, then you don't have any right to that information. And yet it's a global village. Yeah. It, well, and, and this, you know, the, these people are, it's kind of a multi-jurisdictional crime anyway, where you yeah. can have an offender sitting in one country, abusing a child in another country, mm -hmm. using a service that exists in another country with a payment system that exists in another country. I mean, there's yeah. this concept of jurisdiction is really quite a difficult one to, yeah. to put on this type of problem when it is really a transnational sort of crime type. And so um, I, I do think, you know, and, and Simon and Devin both, both hit upon this is that, you know, there is a large, you know, this is a societal problem. Uh, police can only do so much, you know, parents and people who are educating children can only do so much. I, I think we're, we're underutilizing technology. And as we move more and more towards this, this idea of uh, digital footprints and like using, you know, social media companies, ISP, this is all a digital community that, that you know, these guys touch upon as they, as they start to groom children, as they trade materials. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting the information right now is, is, is really difficult. I mean, that's kind of the, one of the things, especially as you kind of touched upon where here in Australia, where you have to pay to kind of get that information um, to save a child. Um, I, just from experience in the United States, this is a service that is provided by the ISPs. This is, you know, just something morally, I think that just this should be built into the system where there's a child in danger. We have information that could prevent that child you know, it, just the idea of charging anything more than zero dollars to to get information that could help safeguard the children is is kind of unfathomable to me. But, um, you know, that's just kind of what happens right now. And, and so, um, yeah, getting access to that information is, is quite difficult. But um, I think the much larger thing is as we start to move on to online grooming 
And, you know, offenders are more and more hiding in the safety of their home using a telephone to connect directly to a child. Mm -hmm. uh, I think technology is being underutilized at this point, especially with a lot of the, the larger companies where, mm -hmm. I, um, you know, there's significant amounts of money being put into algorithms to identify your habits and what you what you click, you know, to kind of feed you more information of like what's useful to you. It, it mm -hmm. seems to me like we could stop a lot of this activity where you have one account contacting thousands of, of underage children um, for no reason. And, you know, in multi, multiple jurisdictions, it seems like, you know, we could be using technology to prevent this from happening. And I think that's the biggest thing because mm -hmm. even though we're trying to get to the information, this is just one child out of a vast sea of, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of children. Like yeah. why, why can't we stem the flow of this significantly so you know the, the number of children that are being exploited is is dramatically lower absolutely well i i feel a new campaign growing here um, mm. uh, uh, directed to the telcos uh, surely corporate social responsibility would uh, dictate that you hand over these details and uh, protect and rescue these children uh, because otherwise you're enabling and, and facilitating it and you're and it shouldn't become part of your business model that you would actually profit uh, mm. from assisting police in their investigations. So uh, yeah. we'll add this to our next team at team meeting and I mean, uh, do, in, do something about this. If I could just say something, Please I mean, Steph, yes. you know, one of the one of the big points that um, Scott pointed out, it's you know, it's almost like the million dollar question where um, when we're dealing with social media companies and telcos and. Um, issues around privacy, you know, the, the the big kind of, you know, automatic screen that companies can put around them yeah. where they end the conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Scott really put it so succinctly um, in the documentary, mm -hmm. when did the rights of privacy trump yeah. basic human rights and social rights? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a question for the room and it's one of those, you know, one of those points in the film that I think we all walk away thinking and scratching our heads, mm. going, actually, yeah, you know, was I ever asked about that? Like, did I ever really have any say in that? It was, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, these behaviours that are, are generated by social media companies around privacy and your data and your ID have almost been forced upon us and uh, we accept it. We don't challenge it. Dev, I'm so glad you said that because it was actually one of my uh, favourite quotes from, from the film. It just, it just nailed that whole shield of privacy uh, argument when we're talking about children being tortured, you know, being raped, being exploited um, in the most horrific ways. So, th you know, thank you for, for quoting that again. I'm going to move to my colleague, uh, Lynn, just a reminder to the audience, you can, you can ask questions of the panel and feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, my colleague, uh, Lynn Kennedy, now I know we've been critical of uh, social media platforms tonight, but uh, you know, my team, I met half of them on social media and uh, came across Lynn on Twitter. And uh, mm. she was really um, smacking a company big time, a corporate big time, um, and we thought, gosh, she, she's really good at this. She needs to be on our team. And uh, that's how we met. And Lynn, do you want to just tell us um, about the linkages here between this film and our work at um, Collective Shout, and particularly your, your very tenacious efforts tracking down uh, predators, specifically on Instagram. Lynn has uh, tracked thousands of, of predators and reported them and... Uh, to the extent of actually capturing them, filming them in action, uh, for example, live masturbating to Australian schoolgirls in recognisable school uniforms uh, during their Instagram lives. And uh, Lynn, what is the, the Insta to porn pipeline here? How does that, how does that work? Well, I, thanks, Melinda. I think um, the film highlighted very well that what's happened is social, mainstream social media platforms have allowed um, what was once happening in these dark corners of the, uh, the, the, sorry, the internet to be transferred into, out into plain sight, into plain view onto these mainstream platforms that 
you and I and all of us use. Um, and so we are seeing, um, again, I, I realize that it's a drop in the ocean of what we've just um, had an insight into that task force Argos and experts, law enforcement agencies and officers around the world see. And yet we see a filtered version of that happening on, on Instagram. We see a teen, a young teen and preteen girls being fetishized, um, sexualized, harassed, exploited. That, that example that you just gave, Melinda, um, I've seen that happen to a nine-year-old on Instagram. And so these are real crimes happening to real children on mainstream social media platforms that we all use. Yeah. And so we've been part of a, to go, to go on further, we've been part of a two-year um, campaign called Wake Up Instagram. It's a joint global campaign with partners in the US, Nicosi, and Defend Dignity in, in Canada. And we've been calling on Facebook to stop facilitating these harms to, to underage girls and boys and to fix these problems that they are, they are facilitating these very serious harms to children. Mm -hmm. We've had a question come in and Lynn, I think you could answer this and also I think Scott, you could as well. With these social media entities who could so easily put a stop to child sexual exploitation material on their platforms, where do we start? What can non-law enforcement do? What can civil society do? You've already made the very valid point that we can't uh, arrest our way out of this. Uh, so we need uh, corporates, we need big tech and civil society to work together to stop this. But we have been so frustrated with the social media platforms who are, who are worth billions of dollars. You know, they're just these mega companies that are pretty much running society. Uh, and yet nothing really has changed. Uh, you know, they claim they, they're making changes, but the same predators are still there and they're growing all the time and they're, they're on the pages of underage girls all the time. Uh, why isn't enough being done? And uh, how would we answer this, uh, this uh, member of the audience's question? What can non-law enforcement do? Uh, well, if I can start, I, I think there's a lot already being done by, by you know, um, non-techno companies, basically. I mean, you know, the... The police are there to to help protect citizens after a crime has been has been committed. You know, so at that point, by the time we get to it, it's already too late. I mean, this child could have been abused for a day, for a month, a year, a few years, a decade. You know, sometimes even more than that. Uh, but and I've also seen um, you know these these programs that go out and they you know they educate children, they educate parents. Hey, these are the dangers that exist in online. Uh, um, these online social media companies where, you know, you can be a target of somebody, do not give your information, do not send nudes and don't friend anybody who's, who's contacted you. But I don't know how many times I've seen videos where the children are very aware of this or talking to somebody and say, you're not who you say you are. I don't believe you. You're one of those guys. And then 10 minutes later, they are streaming material of themselves, you know, in compromising positions. And so I don't necessarily think that I think it's helping some people, but it's not helping a lot of them. But there's a there's a huge link missing when we come to the tech companies because it, it kind of takes a community to raise a child and to protect a child, you know. And John always uh, John Rouse always likes to use this really amazing analogy of like you know when you when you build a, a park or you build a school for a child, there is multiple layers of protection surrounding that child. You know, you have a fence, you have you have other children watching out for each other, you have the teachers watching out. There's like security cameras. Um, you know, members of the public who can see what's happening around these children. So if anything is amiss, that can be brought to people's attention. But um, mm -hmm. now with, with the, the invention of the internet and social media, you, you now have offenders being able to lurk in the dark, uh, communicate with children without anybody knowing. And then once that child is in a compromising position, you know, um, they get their, their hooks into them and can just ask for more material over and over again. Mm -hmm. But Beyond that, I mean, they're just really good at, at manipulating children. And there's, there's nothing in between a predator 
and a child who, you know, f- for all intents and purposes, doesn't have the emotional mm. um, capability to deal with the with these sorts of problems, to deal with the uh, to know like th- what their actions are going to do, not mm-hmm. just today, but you know, once it's out on the internet, will affect them for the rest of their lives. And there's there's no protection in there. And I think the tech companies um, have a responsibility to kind of help fill in this this chain of community. And I don't mm. know if they're necessarily fulfilling that. Right. You know, and and also also technology technology isn't scalable. It's it you know all the apps come fully sprung and fully loaded. It's like giving the keys to a Ferrari to a five year old. You know, they, and you know back in my day, if you know to use the analogy, when we were when when we had to um, you know earn our stripes with writing, you'd get your pen license. You know, you'd have to practice with a pencil and then you'd go on and, you know, till you could use an ink pen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that social media companies need to start, you know, incorporating like levels of, um, of expandability with their technology because we all know that the kids are going to use it. Yeah. We can't stop kids using it. But, um, you know, to have it at a level that's safe for a kid to be able to... Um, you know, learn the dangers of it, learn the mechanisms of it, really understand how the technology works and have it scalable mm-hmm. and age appropriate. Um, I just don't think that's ever been, you know, a part of what um, tech companies have even envisaged, you know. Melinda, well, I, I, they I would want add. It. They want this audience. They're, you know, Instagram for kids, for heaven's sake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've just seen recently um, Apple announced just, at the beginning of September, that they were they were about to institute a, a method of actually searching for this material in the cloud, in the Apple's iCloud. Uh, the the response was so negative to that from um, those that put privacy ahead of the rights of children that there was a sort of fiasco for Apple. They backed down. Yeah. Um, you know, they lasted two weeks yeah. um, uh, trying to do something about this. I mean, it'll be inter- interested. You may be interested, Melinda. The audience will be interested. Is that our promotions for the film? on both Facebook and Google have been banned, have been taken down. Our accounts have been cancelled. And, and uh, you know, to try and unravel that, I mean, just, just to get to speak to a human being rather than, you know, an algorithm is hard enough, but, you know, I'm not complaining. We're using journalists uh, to help us do that. But, yeah, wow. we've, been, we've been shut down. Um, and, you know, you, you'd think... It would be hard to justify that, but they they will they will get away with it as long as they can until they're called to question. And I might add, and I'm I'm sure Scott has some opinions about this. I mean, we've seen the fuss about about um, Facebook this week from a whistleblower talking about you know important issues, you know the body dysfunctional psychology that's affected for young women on Instagram. Yes, important issues, and we've also peeled back the the evidence to see that internally Facebook knows this going on, but won't do anything unless, um, and, you know, unless there's a financial priority for it. But this is a much bigger issue. This is the one they've all, they, they all know is coming one day. And this is the one that will really hurt them because, you know, there is just no justification for having so much vast material, this, this you know, ghastly toxic material on, on their servers, on their platforms and facilitating it They'll, they won't get away with this one, but we've got to break through that silence factor. And I mean, you've done great work, Melinda, you know, in bringing attention to, you know, sexualization and advertising and companies that, you know, use just, just ghastly ways of trying to reach, you know, make a buck. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is the big one. It's, it, you know, we may not be the one that helps it break through, but we'll certainly begin that process. And I think um, to, you know, for society to have a really kind of grown up conversation about this, because in the end, you know, I read a tech, a tech, influential tech writer yesterday saying, maybe it's the mothers of the world that have to actually bring this one to a head. It's, it's, it's that, you know, as they did with alcohol advertising, as they did with, you know, car safety, it was, it was basically, you know, down to a family issue. And what I don't get, Scott, I don't know if you can, I mean, if you were the phone company, the ISP or the phone manufacturer or the social media platform that said, you know what, we're going to be child safe. We're going to put child safety as a priority. That's what makes us different to the others. You think that would be a pretty good business model, um, given that none of them do anything about it, just to stand out from the crowd. But we can't even get them to that kind of, you know, even talking on their sort of, you know, let's make a buck out of it. 
Um, even on that level, they haven't been prepared to go there yet. And I think it's because they haven't been forced to. Yeah. Yeah, we agree with you, of course, 100%. And you're just getting us all fired up all over again and uh, on this. So uh, we look forward to, to continuing working with you to see some changes. I've got a very good practical question here. How are communities being encouraged and educated to report something if they're concerned about suspicious uh, behaviour? Perhaps this is another one for you, Scott. What, what are the steps uh, that members of the community should, should take when they are suspicious uh, that a child is vulnerable and at, and at risk? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, Melinda, because um, I, I see a lot of time, even when I, I send out, um, you know, uh, intelligence to, to law enforcement and say, hey, this child has been connected. I, I think even uh, approaching the child is, is one of those things where they, they are automatically berated. They are, they, you know, they are automatically shamed and stuff like that. And so I think that prevents children from, from actually telling anybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in some of these instances, the, the children are victims in this, you know, they've been approached by, by somebody who has manipulated them into making them believe that they're the same age as them and have got them to transmit material of themselves across the network. And I think as, as parents as a society, uh, I think we need to understand that in some instances, and in a lot of these instances, this is not a, a single event that mm -hmm. falls to the responsibility of the child to do something that maybe they, they failed to do, which was you know not engage with these people. But um, uh, so many times uh, when we go investigate and interview these children and explain to them, you know, hey, you are just one small cog in this person's list who has thousands of victims like you. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to find out any information that we can to, to stop him from abusing and exploiting other children. And the main things that we see a lot of the time is um, the children are berated. berated. Um, we, we start to see this victim blaming. Uh, the children are very embarrassed that they were they were caught, and so like they will lie and say that they you know this wasn't them. The 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 parents will be angry, and and if they do this and they try and take care of this internally, the first thing that they do is delete the account, block the account, delete all of the information, and let's never speak about this again. And as law enforcement, like that information doesn't help because as, as we've said, getting information from the ISPs, from social media companies can be very challenging mm -hmm. if you don't have the cooperation of the people who have actually been a victim. Mm -hmm. And so um, my advice is the moment you know it's happening, alert law enforcement as soon as possible. And so go straight, to, go straight to ACE? Uh, well, anybody, any, any local law enforcement will yeah. will do. It. I mean, here in Australia, you have e-safety, you have you have you know local law enforcement. Anybody um, who deals with them, who is a police yes. officer, can help get the information to the people that that it needs. And there's a kids' helpline as well, so the children themselves yeah. can do this without having to to tell their their parents mm -hmm. or their caregivers necessarily. And and yes, and of course, the the criminals are working on shame they're working on embarrassment they you know that's how they get their grips on these kids and so obviously you know it's difficult for parents i'm sure in an awful situation but but to actually shame the child more is not certainly not going to help resolve it and it's not going to help people like scott do anything about it either right. yeah. uh, and it's not going to allow other children to want to come forward after that after they see their friends that's being right. behaved that's as it. such yeah, because the first thing that parents do is take away the technology and take away their lifeline to the rest of their friends. And it's, it's, that's definitely a, a negative way of dealing with the issue. Melinda, I must say, just, just, you know, the people at Argos, one of the cases that was playing out through the courts while we were there mm. um, and Argos Discovery was one, you know, a, um, a senior le university lecturer just down the road from Argos, in, entirely coincidentally, at mm. QUT, this is one man who was masquerading as a pop star online. Oh, yeah. Um, I think they, I think, Scott, you might remember the numbers better than me, but over 300 victims were identified. Was that the Justin Bieber? Yes, the there? Justin Bieber case, yeah. Mm. And, you know, over 300 victims, one man. Yeah. One man had, you the, know. The, the thing that I found frightening about that case is mm. that it actually came from one individual Facebook referral mm -hmm. that went to a, a, a an NGO that's like a clearinghouse that can sort and sift and triage material, and the 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 actual tip off was quite innocuous. It was just like this doesn't feel right, you know. And it was just one report. 
And yet it had been going on in plain sight for a long time. I yes. mean, you, look, look, all of that, all of that aside, this is just one report. Facebook in 2020 had 20 million reports yeah, internally right. reported. So, and this guy had, yeah, it was actually more than 300 victims. It was, you know, around the 600 victim mark. Um, 300 yeah. identified, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> phenomenal numbers. So just yeah. staggering on the scale. But yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, if if I had my kind of like last word on it, um, you know, in, 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 and, and it's that, um, you know, the million dollar question, what do we do? Yeah. And what do we hope this film achieves, you know? Um, I hope this film makes us realise, okay, you've had to really swallow a really, a really hard, big horse pill of bad information. And, but that's all, but that's as bad as it's ever going to have to get for you to absorb what's happening to our kids. Yeah. The, the bad news is, is that it's going to get worse unless we do something about it. it. Now, if we start behaving or adjusting ourselves internally into the people that I just interviewed in that documentary and put our kids first, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I think I've actually... We've actually shown in the documentary the good exists in the world mm-hmm. and the people that we've filmed are doing that. We all need to take that on as, as an ethos if mm-hmm. we're ever going to make a dent in this or if we're ever going to make a change. Yes. So that's what, that's what I hope the documentary achieves. I, I think we can, Melinda. I think, I think we can make Scott and his colleagues, we can make their job a little easier. Their job will never end because there's just, you know, too much for them to do uh, as Adele Desire says in the film, you know, she she explains the length she's gone through just to catch one bad actor. Mm-hmm. And she's got, you know, she's got a case collection of maybe 600 on her desk just yeah, to deal with. Right. Um, you know, uh, so their work is never going to end. Um, but I, I do, I see, you know, it's a technology crime. There are technology solutions to this crime. What we have to do is, is find a way of shaming half a dozen companies in the world. You know, that's the challenge. And stopping uh, and the others will then be to forced end-to-end to end encryption, which is uh, going yeah, to, yeah. as John I mean, Ralph said. Let's not start on, on Facebook. You know, those 20 million reports that Dev talked about, they're about to disappear overnight. <laughs> and, that's it. Um, and, and that will just make Scott's job just immensely harder. Hmm. But, but that, you know, that can be reversed. And, and, and it's, always term, it's always phrased in terms of black and white too, encryption, privacy, encryption, privacy. No, it's, it's, it's not that. There's a whole area in the middle where children can be protected. And why do we need to protect the privacy of online predators? I That's mean, it. we don't have to do it. Who, who, who could argue against that? Not even the privacy zealots will argue against that. So, but, so it's finding that balance and it's a technology solution that will make that available. But until there's a willingness for them, until they get a bit of heat about this, yeah. they're, really, they're really not going to change um, because they don't have to. But interestingly, out of last week, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, in his you know, pretty strong defence, there was no apology from him about all the, the most recent revelations, but, but there was a kind of chink of light where he actually accepted, I think, um, in a tweet where he said that, you know, we're going to have to be willing to accept regulation of a kind. And, and you know, this the head of Instagram phrased it, well, you know, it's a bit like, Instagram is a bit like the car industry. You know, cars are, cars are dangerous in the wrong hands, but, you know, they're a great benefit for society. And I thought, what a stupid analogy. You have to be licensed to drive a car and the automotive industry is one of the most regulated in the world. So what he was actually saying, okay, let's regulate. Yeah. And I think that is really our only... Uh, you know, that has to happen. So we need legislators, we need lobby groups, we need the public's concern. And, you know, it's a combination of those law enforcement, I don't think can shout any louder than they, the warning than they've been giving us. So yes. it's, we all have a, a role to play in finding solutions to this, because in the end, I mean, we can make endless films about, you know, another, another terrible criminal or another, you know, another massive network or, you know, there's endless stories, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'd, I'd rather be, you know, making films about solutions. Sure. Well, we agree with you 100%. Uh, Lynn, do you want to say something uh, in summary about the failures of self-regulation? Because these uh, global entities, these mega corporates, have had it their way for too long. And we've been uh, fighting 
against self-regulation for a long time because it has worked in the vested interest of these corporations, uh, but not in the interests of the welfare of the community and especially vulnerable children. Uh, so Lynn, do you want to say something about our work in that, in that space before I wrap up? Specifically regarding... Well, just challenging the whole self-regulatory model, which, which hasn't worked. It hasn't worked in terms of, you know, advertising. It certainly hasn't worked in terms of the uh, global porn industry. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's one of our briefs as well. Lynn, if you want to say something about that or any other reflections... Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't, isn't it a, a real um, eye opener to think that Zuckerberg needs regulation to get the predatory men away from the little girls. And that is an abhorrent Those. reflection on his company, his an abhorrent um, state of affairs. That, that is disgraceful corporate behavior and he should be grilled for that. And uh, I mean, if that's what it takes, good, bring it. But what stopped him for a decade from stopping the connection of predatory men to underage young teen and preteen girls for a decade? His company has dished up little girls as men's sexual entertainment and he has profited. Adam Masseri as well. And I am determined to name their names because big tech has a hide space. It presents as this nameless, faceless, morally neutral blob that has not been held accountable. Let's name these men and let's hold them accountable. Okay. Um, Self-regulation has not worked. Bring the regulation, but shame on them that if, that is what it took. If I could, if I could just say one thing, but not not to not to add to your point or whatever. But I I I, I really need to make this point really clear. It's not just little girls. There are so no, I, many I, boys sure. that are abused in this space. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Scott can answer on on that as well. It's um. It's children. It, it's, it's children. children. It's children. Yeah. In all, in, you know, we've got to we've got to put a bracket around it. I think um, I think that could be, you know, maybe a part of the problem if we're just saying that we're um, sexualizing girls or grooming little girls. But there is, you know, an incredible predatory behavior that goes to um, the grooming of young boys and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, we, it's all kids. It's all kids. That's we absolutely, 100%, we fully appreciate that. What I would say is that in my experience um, monitoring this type of activity on Instagram, and I have reported countless, countless uh, accounts where little boys are being sexualized, um, preyed upon. I, I see that as well. Uh, but in my experience, um, and that this is within the scope of our campaign against Instagram, uh, what I have seen um, is that it is done so routinely to, to young girls, almost um, to the, the point where people don't blink I, I see 12 year olds modeling in G strings and people don't battle an eyelid. <laughs> you know, it's, it's framed as modeling or gymnastics or, or dancing when really what we see is, is Instagram um, pitching these girls as though they're influencers and, and they're going to be stars and they're modeling. So it's presented as this innocuous activity when really we know what, exactly what it is. It's sexual entertainment for men. That's it. Well, I'm gonna to have to wrap up now. Um, if you would all like to be more involved, please keep following the Children in the Pictures website and social media. We'd love you to join Collective Shout if you haven't already. CollectiveShout.org is our website. We're on 
uh, all the social media uh, platforms. Uh, we're engaging in everything from sexualization of uh, girls through to objectification of women to uh, trafficking the global sex industry, uh, pornography and violence against women and all the intersections uh, between uh, those things. Um, CollectiveShark.org, uh, I believe a colleague will be, uh, Renee will be dropping some uh, links into the chat for you. And if you have friends that couldn't make it tonight, we're going to have an encore. Uh, we will be resharing the film and this panel discussion on the 22nd of October, the 22nd of, of this month. So please encourage uh, your friends and family, anyone you think might be interested to uh, have a look at our website, collectiveshout.org, our social media. We'll have the details for that second screening up early next week, hopefully, hopefully on Monday. And uh, we'd love to keep this conversation going. It, it, it'll take the village, everyone needs to be involved. So please uh, spread the word about this film. And, and can I thank the panelists? Uh, Dev, can I thank you, Simon, for bringing this film to us, so important. Our team was so heartened and so encouraged that you made this film. And to know that the word is now getting out globally um, about this, uh, this fastest growing crime uh, Scott, thank you so much to you and your colleagues. We all owe you a debt of gratitude for yeah. staring into this abyss and trying to save as many children as you can every day. We really are grateful, uh, so grateful to you. We, we understand the cost uh, of, of that work that it must take on you. Uh, thank you to everyone who's participated and uh, get involved, spread the word. And uh, thanks again so much. And, and thanks to, to FanForce as well for distributing this film. Uh, around the world. So I'll end it there. Uh, thank you again very much. Thanks, Melinda. We appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank, thank you, Scott. You. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.